Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very, very warm welcome to the Penny's 2021 celebration event. It is absolutely great to have you all with us here uh, this evening in this stunning space at Rothschilds in the city. And uh, of course, for those of you joining us and choosing to tune in at home, a very warm welcome to you as well. And thank you for being with us. So as you can see, my name is Sally Bundock. And I have to say, it's really really delightful to join Penny's again and to be your host for this event. So as always, there's some housekeeping to do here. So just to say, if you have mobile phones with you, I'm sure you do, can you make sure they're on silent, please, or, or off? <laughs> and also, if an alarm does go off, it is genuine. It, there is no rehearsals or um, such matters of that this evening. It will be a genuine alarm and we just need to leave in an orderly fashion. You've seen the staircases already, both to my right and my left. So that's something we have to be across. So tonight, not only will we be inspired, we will be challenged with some lively discussions that we have lined up for you uh, later this evening, but we will also be hearing about some of the key updates from Pennies, where uh, they are on a mission, where they are headed, and the news about the latest brands that will be joining uh, the movement. So there's an awful lot packed in to this evening's agenda. There's also the important job of celebrating the successes of key partners as the winners of the 2021 Pennies Awards will be revealed. So we hope you will be awash with questions, with uh, thoughts around how you as individuals and also as leaders, how you can further stimulate and drive the momentum that we are seeing within business uh, to be a positive purpose and to affect social change. So what's on the agenda? Well, you've got a bit of a sneak preview behind me here. Uh, first up, we're going to hear from the Chief Executive of Pennies, which is, of course, Alison Hutchison. I'm sure you all know her well in this room. So she's going to set the scene uh, for the discussion and for the evening initially. Then, of course, you can see we have our keynote speaker, Sir Malcolm Walker. It's delightful to have him with us this evening. Founder of Iceland. He'll be giving us his take on the function of charity within big business. The power of micro donations will be demonstrated by Worldplay, which is a key partner with Penny. So we'll be hearing from Gabriel, uh, Gabriel de Montesus, who is, as you can see, group president and EVP of Worldplay International. And then we have our panel discussion. We have got a fantastic array of leaders in the retail and hospitality industry. Two industries, I'm sure you're well aware, have been seriously challenged in the last 18 to nearly 20 months. Um, still, they're pressing through and making a difference pennies at a time. So the panel discussion will be uh, an excellent discussion, of course. And then we have those awards uh, to give out to look at those who've championed social purpose through micro donations in the last 12 months. And then, of course, we've got the all important networking. And I believe there's some nibbles and bubbles for us to enjoy. For those of you at home, get it on ice in your fridge. So let's crack on with our agenda. I'm very pleased to hand over to Alison Hutchison, who we've already mentioned, CEO of Pennies, who's been awarded a CBE for her services to the economy and to charities. She leads a small but very dedicated team at Pennies, working across sectors to open up new market channels and technologies to enable consumer giving. So without further ado, please give Alison a very warm welcome. Well, good evening, everyone. It's not true there's a secret weapon here, but I do need it to keep standing up straight, so forgive me with having my extra little crutch tonight. Listen, please may I add a huge Penny's welcome to everybody. It's so wonderful to see us all together in a space in such an amazing backdrop. 
but to all of you at home, please join in. We're so delighted that you can join us and we can try our first ever hybrid event. So it should be really great fun. Now listen, I've got a couple of thank yous to start off. First to Sally, because Sally joined us for our first virtual event last year and by popular demand and wiggling around your holidays and your very early start, thank you so much Sally, we really appreciate you joining us again. And we'd also like to thank WorldPay from FIS because quite frankly without them tonight just wouldn't happen and that's the second year in a row you've put investment behind us and we really, really appreciate it. And my third thank you is to my little team, because you'll see them sparkled around all over the place. But we are a small team and they've done everything to pull tonight together while I've been a little bit otherwise occupied in the early part of November. So you all know who you are and I think you're all fab. So thank you very much indeed. Now I was thinking 12 months ago, there's some things that have changed tremendously, but there's others that haven't really. And I was reminded when I was getting ready for today that in November last year, we didn't have any vaccinations approved in the fight against COVID. And yet you fast forward 12 months and the majority of adults have had two jabs. Some might have had a booster. I won't ask your age because then you'll get offended. But you know, the number of people that have it and we are learning to live with COVID. I know sadly people are still getting it. I know it's causing trouble for companies and for families but the health risk is so much more reduced. And isn't it great that we're in a very different place? But I also remember saying last year that in March 2020, the majority of businesses took their plan and put them in the shredder because nobody had any clue about how to respond to what we were all facing because we all had absolutely zero understanding. Well, I'd argue 20 months on from that, yes, we have a much better understanding, but at November last year, none of us predicted lockdown three, the months of closure in 2021. As retailers and hospitality have been opening up, we all know about the tremendous supply chain issues, distribution, availability of drivers, availability of colleagues for most functions to say that, the increase in costs, the uncertain economy, I think probably the last 20 months has been the most difficult playbook for retail and hospitality that there has ever been, certainly in the last decade. So I would forgive those leaders if they said, right now, I'm just going to focus on the here and now, and I'm going to focus on what really matters. But that's not what we are finding at Pennies. Pennies only does a small thing I'll talk about in a minute. But we've had an overwhelming response from people wanting to join this movement and be a force for good. So I salute all of you to face into that difficult 20 month playbook, but also find time to put social purpose at the heart of businesses, which is absolutely brilliant. For those of you who are new to Pennies, a special welcome and a welcome to all of you at home, because there's lots of us here that want to chat to you to share our views and experience. We're a tiny charity with a big vision. We've taken the world's most popular way of giving, which is dropping coins in a box, and just recognised that we're all cashless and we're shopping through different channels. So that's what we do as a charity, but we're independent so that the retailer can nominate the charity or charities that they want to get behind. Now, because everything we raise is through our retail and hospitality partners, you can imagine in March 2020, how devastated we were, not only for what was happening clearly in society, but 80% of our doors shut. And some of those doors were also our digital doors. We weren't booking hotels, we weren't booking holidays. You fast forward 18 to 20 months, despite months, months of people being in lockdown, we've seen a 10% increase in the volume of consumer donations, which is quite extraordinary. Maybe not so surprising, you've seen e-commerce more than double over that period of time. But when you get behind why that is, it's because where consumers can give, they are continuing to give and give in their droves because they love being able to give a little and to achieve a huge amount of money. But we've also seen those brands that have the challenges I talk about come to us and say, but we want to get involved because now is the moment. Last year, I announced we had a record-breaking number of merchants join us. This year, 
We've already broken that record. And by the end of this year, we'll have over 20 new retail brands joining the pennies movement. Now, you'd like to think, or you might think, they are mainly app and e-commerce merchants, of which many are. But there's also a huge number of traditional face-to-face -face retail and restaurants. In fact, before the pandemic, we talk about storefronts, shop fronts. Pennies was available in about 6,000 different storefronts. We're already at 7,500, and I can tell you that with the people we are speaking to, it will be a matter of months before we break through 10,000 shop fronts. So the acceleration behind pennies, at a time when you think it just doesn't make sense, is really, really heartwarming. And you might wa wonder, well, why is that? Well, the reality is, and those of you that are in the charity sector here tonight, I salute you too, because it's been a horrid, horrid couple of years. It really has. 70% of charities are still saying that COVID is impacting their ability to do what they do best. And for a second year in the row, just last month, when I looked at pro bono economics, there was a 53% of charities are saying they've got demand they can't service. And for the second year in a row, 49% have had less income to be able to support it. This is a sector that has no easy fixes. And so, yes, business is challenged, but we all need to do what we can. And I think we all know that we want to do what we can. And that's when I come back to a cashless society. If you thought we were cashless before COVID, you should see where we are now. And I went back to UK finance. And do you know that when we started pennies 11 years ago, 56% of all transactions were paid for by cash. Last year, that was down at 17%. And there's now 13.7 million adults in the UK say they live a completely cashless life. And yet those very people are the ones that are saying more than ever coming out of the pandemic, I want to care about others more than myself. I want to be a little bit less selfish. I actually want to give back, but I'm actually quite worried about my wallet because we all know about the increase in energy prices and fuel prices. We all know what's happening in inflation and people are worried about how much cash they've got. So if they've got an ability to give just a little bit, but no together, that makes a huge difference. That's exactly what you're doing. So you take that and add the pressure that investors and funders are having on all companies to deliver on their ESG agenda, the environment, their social, and also their governance. And we all know clearly COP26 is very vibrant up in Glasgow. And I really hope and pray that those countries can come together with investment and action to start to deliver in that Paris Agreement, because we need it and we need it now. But I don't think people are just worried about the climate. I think the social part has come into the spotlight in a way that we would never, ever have imagined. We have to give back to our colleagues. We have to think of our customers. We need to think of our broader responsibility, and we also need to support those charities. So for whichever way you look at it, you can see why actually there's a real momentum building for us. Consumers that want to give, but maybe don't have as much confidence of the cash in the wallet. Charities that need the help, companies that want to do good and want to make sure that they are there to deliver a legacy. That's possibly why we are delighted to feel that momentum absolutely building. But you know, Pennies is a small team. There are only 17 of us, and we just cannot do it ourselves. We are supported by hundreds of people, of ambassadors, of champions, of everyday people that just look at what can they do to help us. But there's a couple of organizations or a couple of areas in particular I'd like to thank tonight. One is we have been adopted as a pro bono charity of so many organizations this year. People like Blue Train Marketing and Hotwire, People like Vendicom and the Emerging Payment Association and MBS as part of our recruitment that we'll hear about later. Because we just don't have the funds to do the size of the challenge that we have as pennies. So they are absolutely critical to us. And thank you all very much indeed. Now, as a charity ourselves, we also need to raise funds. And we are very thoughtful about how we raise those while still supporting the whole of the UK charity sector. And that meant for us, 
we have been dependent on a few very major donors that have given us huge funds to support us. There's a number of foundations, a number of individuals, and a number of companies. And the, what we say to them and what we've evidenced is that we are one of the top most efficient and effective charities in the UK. For every one pound we spend, we create £11.44 of social return and investment. Because there are only 17 of us, we are digital, but the impact we have with our partners is really quite mind-blowing. And there's two funders in particular, the Oak Foundation and the Pears Foundation, that have been with us from the start. They held my hand when I said, I've got this wacky idea, what do you think? I need to get off the ground, can you help me? Can I lower my tone? I was very excited. Um, but you know, there I was with this exciting idea that I had no idea whether or not we could turn it into reality. And they stood by me and they held our hand. 10 years on, there was the challenges of COVID and we first reported that we didn't know what would happen. They stood by us and in fact, they have now committed to stand by us for the next few years as we move to self-sustainability. Now that is a long-term commitment and we owe them a huge, huge thanks. So just before I round off in setting the scene, if anybody, never mind Scottish people or Yorkshire people, if anybody says that a penny isn't worth anything, I fundamentally disagree with them. Now, 50% of us don't pick a penny off a street, and yet those pennies add up to making a huge, huge difference. Some of our partners, if you take Domino's, every 10 minutes now, their customers' donations fund an hour of care for a teenager fighting cancer. Two hours at Green King pubs fund 12 hours of a Macmillan nurse. And at Azizi, they support the Mental Health Foundation, which is a growing issue we know in society. And just a lunchtime of clicks means that 90 people can get the specialist help they need. So don't let anybody tell you a penny doesn't count. I hope that gives you a start to the day. Oops. I think I'm causing chaos with my extra little um, prop here, so I do apologise. And it's Sally's water as well, Sally, so I really do apologise. We'll get there in the end. But listen, thank you everybody very much indeed. It's about far more than pennies. We've got a massive social agenda ahead of us, and I'm sure we're in for some great insights. Sally, I'll pass back to you a little wetter than I was. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alison. And do you catch that passion? Don't you get it? Um, a small but incredibly dynamic team making a huge difference. Um, so now uh, let me introduce to you our next, uh, our keynote speaker, Sir Malcolm Walker, CBE. So Malcolm is a very well-known entrepreneur who famously founded Iceland way back when, in 1970, I believe it was one shop, and 30 pounds in terms of capital. And as you know today, uh, Iceland is a huge organization with annual sales of almost four billion pounds. It's a name we all know very well indeed. Always a pioneer as well, Iceland, in doing the right thing for customers and for the, the environment. So Iceland has been a trailblazer on in many, many initiatives. Most recently, its aim to eliminate, eliminate plastic packaging from its own label range uh, by 2023. The CEO of Iceland is one I've interviewed quite a few times who's very vocal on the environment and what uh, big retail can do to make a huge difference. So please give a very warm welcome to Sir Malcolm Walker. Majid from Rothschilds called me a while ago, which is unusual as I normally have to call him. And then even more unusually, he started to make small talk uh, until he eventually he got to the point, which was, I need a favour. So here I am. Uh, I've been asked to talk to you about Iceland's charitable involvement and explain to you what we do and why we do it. And if, in my opinion, there is any upside for a company in charitable giving. I suppose the bottom line is that I've got to convince you that putting your hand in, the, in your pocket is not only a good thing, but worthwhile, because there is payback. 
First, I suppose I should say that at Iceland we are perhaps very unconventional in our approach. <clears throat> we can do this because we're not a public company. We are a private business, but even when we were public, I acted like I owned the place anyway. So we do things differently. The press used to describe me as a maverick, and I quite like that. Um, we've had our own Iceland Foods Charitable Foundation since 1973. But our charitable involvement really got serious in the early 80s when we were a founder member of something called the Percent Club. And we had to agree to give half a percent of our annual profits to charity every year, which we did in cash, not kind. Most of the companies cheated and gave their quota in kind. Uh, I googled it recently and I don't think it exists anymore. Anyway, that got us started and we've given money every year ever since. Apart from four years I was out of the business from 2001 to 2005 when I was fired from my own company. Uh, but my successor who was big into corporate governance, a full quarter of non-execs, process procedure, committees, etc. But basically he couldn't run a chip shop. Uh, and he gave nothing to charity for those four years, partly because Iceland didn't make any profit. So that is, that's my first point. A company can't give away money unless it makes money. And following on from that, I'm not one of those people who quietly give anonymously. I'm not rich enough for that. So I've got no embarrassment about publicising what we do, taking as much credit as possible and pushing the PR story. And we have a website boasting about our charitable involvement and I've even brought our books for you to read today, telling you all the good things that we do. Because it's good for the company's image, it makes me feel good, our customers like it, and most importantly, our staff like it. So the next question is, how do we choose our charities? We've got a thousand shops on the high street, and because we are so visible, we are a prime target and get hundreds of requests every month from local charities for sponsorship and so on. And we have to ignore 95% of them with a nice letter back explaining that we're inundated requests and we've got commitments elsewhere. So how do we choose? Well, most democratic organisations will have a charity committee. Listen to their staff suggestions or maybe just make sure they can't be criticised for not following due process. We've got a different system. I decide. <laughs> uh, and there's a good reason for that. There are thousands of not very worthy charities out there. Many are very worthy, but how do you decide between buying life-saving incubators for a baby ward, or supporting the arts, or even the hedgehog rescue charity? The NHS should buy the incubators anyway, which makes it even more complicated. How do you decide which charity will get the full support of your staff? Which is the most worthy, or which will be relevant uh, a relevant involvement for your company and I would imagine that the CEO of a big company might personally be into the arts and it pushed for the money to go there. Is that for his own benefit and prestige or for the greater good? From the outset we decided to give money to small charities where our contribution would make a real difference. I used to say giving money to a rich charity for example like Oxfam was like throwing a pebble into the Pacific. It made no difference. And given our company slogan at the time was Mum's Gone to Iceland, then small, worthy children's charities seemed like a good idea. <clears throat> we also got to be able to sell the idea to our staff. They were the fundraisers. And we also decided to give everything to just one charity every year so we could maximise our impact. And some were so emotionally involving for our staff that we supported them for several years. And yes, there was always a little bit left over for other things, but by and large, we wanted impact. Every year in our stores, we've got a charity week. It's a big event, usually in August, which is the quietest month for sales, so it doesn't impact customers too much. Our staff climb mountains, dress up in stupid costumes, wash cars, and generally get up to all sorts of sponsored events to raise cash. We do this because our staff love it. It's bonding, uh, morale raising, it makes us feel good, and they get behind it. And we usually raise about half a million pounds in that week. We also involve our suppliers in fundraising. 
and we have a, an annual golf day with a big boozy dinner and entertainment afterwards, and we've been running this for 25 years. Take Up is brilliant, not because the suppliers are, are that fussed about supporting our charity, but because they like playing golf and it's an excuse for the company to pay. Uh, and this year, uh, we've just finished the event and we've raised 660,000. So let me illustrate how we get our staff and suppliers to buy in and support a charity that they haven't chosen themselves. We sell them the idea emotionally. For example, in the past, we've given money to support building a facility for children with cerebral palsy. Also the Alder Hay Children's Hospital Cancer Ward, which we supported for three years to the tune of three million. And they're very easy charities to pull on people's heartstrings. And we generally do this with an unashamedly emotional video. We made a great one for Alder Hay Children's Hospital, but it's nearly five minutes long and there isn't time to show it to you. So here's a shorter one, which we made about help for heroes. We showed this to our staff at the golf and also on the golf day, and uh, we raised one and a half million in 2010. So here's the video. I still choke up when I watch that. So it works. We got into fundraising for forces charities because in the areas where we operate, lots of our customers and staff have children and siblings who are going to the army. So it really resonates with them. We also gave a million pounds to Royal British Legion and another million pounds to help build the new Defence National Rehabilitation Centre for severely disabled veterans and civilians. Sometimes we choose a charity that desperately needs our support, but which might be a hard sell. For personal reasons, I got involved with helping Alzheimer's research. It's easy to think that Alzheimer's is a disease of an old people. So maybe it doesn't matter very much. You just put granny in a home for the last few months of her life and sell the conscience with a weekly visit or a call. Not really. It can affect people of all ages. There's 800,000 people in the UK suffering from it now, and one in three people in this room will die of it. Diagnosis to death is typically seven horrible years with a gruesome end. It ruins the lives of family members who often become unpaid carers. There's no cure and nobody knows what causes it. And when I got involved, the annual budget for research in the UK was just eight million. Even worse, Government support for carers is virtually zero. It's not something that was going to be easy to make an emotional video about. Most videos that I've seen avoid reality and typify a couple of happy elderly people who've just become a little bit forgetful. It's a disgrace as nothing could be further from the truth. I was asked to make a video about my own experiences with Alzheimer's which I did at my own expense. The charity refused to show it because it was too graphic, or should I say truthful. I recently wrote a foreword for a book on Alzheimer's, but I wasn't allowed to use the word sufferer. They wanted a more sanitized word. Anyway, when I told our staff that we we're going to support Alzheimer's research, to my surprise, it became the easiest sell of all because everybody knows someone who suffers from this terrible disease. And that's another word I wasn't allowed to use, terrible. Anyway, here's how it started. Professor Nick Fox is the top man in the UK on Alzheimer's. I asked him how he gets his funding for research. He said he's got to write a thesis, a proposal which might take months, submit it to the medical body, then in time he might or might not get funding. So I suggested we might just give him a million pounds, no strings attached, to spend as he liked. Of course he didn't believe me, but we did and we've given money every year ever since to a total of about seven million. That makes a huge difference to the paltry eight million funding pot. But due to the raised profile of Alzheimer's, for which I think we've been partly responsible, they now generate about 39 million a year. Anyway, Nick Fox primarily works for UCL. So one day the provost, I had no idea what the provost was, but apparently he's like the headmaster, he invited me to lunch to say thank you for my support. During lunch, I was asking about Alzheimer's and the chances of finding a cure. And he told me that the UK led the world in research. UCL have some of the best neuroscientists in the world. 
but they're spread out, uh, working from cubby holes all over London. Nick Fox's office itself is a cubby hole with an outdated PC in it. He said, if only everybody could be brought together into one state-of-the-art building, there was a real possibility they could make serious progress into finding a cure. He explained they got the building, they got planning permission, it was going to cost 300 million, and there was 100 million short. So there was no way it would ever happen. Driving home, I had an idea. Our charity income had been given a massive boost by the introduction of the five pence carrier bag charge, which by law, after VAT, 4p had to go to charity. So that gave us an additional four million a year. And I calculated that if all the other food retailers, except the Germans, we didn't want to involve them, but <laughs> I think Aldi and Little might be in the audience today, so I better be careful. If all the British food retailers gave just one year's charity bag money, it would be a hundred million. What an opportunity for supermarkets to get together to do something massive for medical science and help save lives. So I set about meeting the uh, CEOs of all the other supermarkets, but you can guess what happened. They got their own charity committees and their internal bureaucracy and unwillingness to upset the charity committee meant that whilst they all agreed it was a great idea, they were largely impotent. Tesco wouldn't even agree to meet me. I did meet the CEO of Sainsbury's in the pub and he explained that they let every store make multiple choices of where their money goes to hundreds of charities, so he couldn't help. So I told him that meant basically they gave to anybody. <laughs> I did, however, manage to get some support from Waitrose, Morrison's, Asda and a few others, and I got 10 million pounds in total. And Iceland gave another 10. So 20 million, not enough. Well, as it happens, it was, because that 20 million got more trigger funding from other sources and the project is now underway. And on top of that, in recent years, we've given a million to prostate cancer, another underfunded medical charity. That's just in case, you know, I had a problem. Um, uh, and uh, we're currently uh, funding our second major campaign to raise awareness for that silent killer sepsis. We also support uh, selected environmental charities in tune with our doing it right sustainable strategy and to children's charities, including Action for Children. Last year, we made every one of our staff a secret Santa where they gave £10 to a needy child and we're doing the same again this year. So in the last 10 years, I reckon we've given £30 million to charity and I know where it's all gone and that it has made a difference, saving and improving lives that otherwise would not have been supported. So that makes me and my Iceland colleagues and our customers feel good. It's helped to build team spirit and morale, and it's enhanced our reputation. So that's why, to me, corporate support for charity is and always will be a win-win, no-brainer. Just before I say thank you, apart from the book that's on your chair boasting about what we do, uh, I bought a um, few hundred of these. Um, it's a, a little graphic illustration about Alzheimer's. If somebody is at the very early stages and the family are wondering what's going to happen, this explains it in a real way. So they're here. I'm not going to take them back uh, to the office. They're too heavy, so you can all have one free. But if uh, the eight ninety nine, if you wanted to leave ten quid on the tray, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. Did, straight talking, very challenging and very clear illustration how big business and charity work together. Yes, if you're on my programme on the BBC, we'd have to have the beeper machine on, wouldn't we? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure the licence fee payer would have something to say. They always do. OK, so <laughs> let's now then introduce our next speaker this evening. We've already mentioned that World Play is a critical partner for pennies and has been for some time. Wellplay FIS is a, is a leader in, pay, in the payment industry. It's got more than 20 years of experience. And our next speaker, Gabriel de Montesus, is Group President and Executive Vice President of Wellplay International. And he sent us this message from the United States. Good evening all. 
speaking on behalf of WorldPay from FIS. We couldn't be prouder of our partnership of 10 plus years as one of Penny's very first payment technology partners. We immediately saw the benefit of harnessing PayTech to enable micro donation. It has been proven that the consuming public is hugely generous and just need firms like ours to help provide the means to give digitally and simply. In this context, it's been a tremendous pleasure to support Penny's initiatives, Alison and her fantastic team, and thus we are very proud to sponsor this annual event. No need to say that our clients also recognize the need and in fact proactively request ways to engage their customers and colleagues with a simple way to give back to their communities. Excitingly, in total, our clients that have opted in to include pennies in their payment systems, namely the entertainer, with bread and names, boots opticians and signets, have raised an incredible six million pounds from their customers' donation. And it is growing fast. We are particularly excited about the prospects ahead. Pennies and WorldPay from FIS teams are on the edge of launching with some large new merchants. We could nearly double the donations raised in the next 12 months. Thanks to these donations, the funds raised for charity have helped causes such as national and regional children's charity hospitals, Click Sergeant, BBC Children in Need, the Royal Association for Deaf People and Alzheimer's Research UK. To give you just a sense of what this means on people in need, to put the impact of these donations into perspective, just a week of donations at Technic, for example, made possible by Penny Solutions, could pay for two weeks of Click Sergeant's community worker, helping young people rebuild their lives and return to work after cancer. So clearly tonight's theme of social purpose in business is incredibly important to FIS and our commitment to serving our colleagues, our customers and the communities we operate in. As such, I'm very sorry I can't be with you tonight, but I know that you will continue to enjoy your evening and you'll be hearing a lot of about all the, in, the partnerships in Penny's ecosystem driven by Alison and the team the ambition and vision that makes this micro donation movement something incredibly special and truly transformative. Enjoy your evening and thank you all for supporting Pennies. Oh, well, thanks to Gabriel for that. Um, if you're watching us live in the US, Gabriel, thank you so much. It's been great to hear from you. It's been really good to hear about Worldplay from FIS on their commitment to their colleagues, customers, communities, and what a long running partnership with Pennies has done in terms of impact. Every penny counts, as Alison has already said. Now, our next uh, moment this evening is the panel discussion. So whilst we get some chairs uh, on the stage here and gather our panellists, let me introduce to you who they are. So basically we are looking at the fact that businesses at all levels now recognise, probably more than ever, especially with COP26 going on at the moment, that they need to demonstrate their ESG credentials. And one is uh, demonstrating that they have authentic social purpose. But how do you do that? How do you uh, engage in that as a business, especially in this challenging environment? And how uh, do you uh, engage your customer in that as well? So we're going to have this conversation. So as you can see behind me here, if you'd like to come onto the stage, panellists, I will talk you through who we've got. So we've got Liz Williams, you can see, Senior Vice President, Managing Director, UK Major Markets, Papa John's International. It's really great to have uh, Liz with us tonight. She's got uh, more than 20 years experience in the food industry. She's worked with both uh, startup and established uh, restaurant brands currently at Papa John's as well. Do have a seat, Liz. And uh, she is in her international role. She leads the strategic direction to drive store and sales uh, growth across 20 
three countries. I hope I've got that right. I might have missed one. But anyway, a big role. So that's great. Gary, do you want to take your seat? We've got Gary Grant, who is founder and executive chair of The Entertainer, which you may well be very familiar with. It's the largest family-owned toy retailer in the UK. It's got 190 stores, uh, more than 2,000 staff. I know it well because it started in Buckinghamshire where I live. I've got three little children. I've been there a lot. I've spent a lot and I've rounded up as well. So I'm very familiar with the entertainer and its relationship with pennies. But Gary's values uh, comes first, which uh, is something that he sort of uh, portrays in his business. For example, his passion is charitable giving. The entertainer uh, gives 10% of its net profits to charity on an annual basis. He encourages his staff to give and he matches what they give as well. So uh, there's an awful lot of giving going on at the entertainer. Ted Bell, if you'd like to take your seat, co-founder and CEO of Freddy's Flowers. So it's Europe's leading subscription-based direct-to-consumer flower business. And uh, it was established seven years ago, now has 170,000 customers, mainly in the UK and in Germany, with plans for further international expansion as well, I understand. So uh, prior to starting Freddy's Flowers, Ted was financial director and the later CEO of Abel and Cole. Then we've got Jerome Saint-Marc, if you'd like to take your seat, uh, Jerome, who is Group Chief Executive of Wilco. So Jerome was appointed CEO in 2020 after joining Wilco two years before that. He's got more than 20 years experience in retail right across Europe, across the US and in Asia as well with full business transformation among his key skill sets, something that can send a shiver down people's <laughs> spines, especially employees. And, uh, and then of course, Alison, do take a seat and uh, let's get started. We have much to discuss. Now, I'd just like to say to those of you watching us at home, please do get involved. Uh, the chat uh, box is the one to click on. Uh, do send in your thoughts, your comments. The Pennies team will respond to that. And for those of you in the audience, if you've got questions or comments, that's afterwards during the uh, canapés and the uh, networking sessions. So do save those questions for then. But uh, let's get started. So, Liz, as you're right at the end there, we may as well begin with you. When it comes to, if we just start by hearing about Papa John's, how it has managed during this unprecedented time, and how have you continued with social purpose, or has it been parked to one side because you have just been managing with the current situation? Thanks. Um, yeah, so at Papa John's, uh, unlike most hospitality businesses, um, we actually were very fortunate in that we could continue to trade, and we traded quite well. Um, so it was different challenges for us. It was, first and foremost, how do we keep our teams and our customers safe? Um, so that was the first thing that we had to do, and um, we obviously did do that, and we kept you know, our teams in stores safe, but also our dough factory and our warehouse. Um, but I think the most important thing for us was, whilst we needed to keep our team safe, was how do we also give something back? Because we're obviously benefiting as a business from the pandemic, which unfortunately a lot of, a lot of businesses benefiting weren't. Benefiting because we were all ordering pizzas. You were all ordering <laughs> pizzas. We so were stuck quite at a home lot. and we were all ordering yeah. pizzas. Yeah. So, um, so what we, we wanted to, to make sure, we always had pennies on board anyway. Um, but it was making sure, and the great thing about pennies is that you can change your charity quite, quite easily. So we obviously you know, changed the charity that we, we were, were currently um, contributing to, to Trussell Trust, which was obviously a food bank, which was helping out. So, so in that respect, it was fantastic that we could, um, we could you know, give back. And we probably raised the most money um, ever during the pandemic. And how do you communicate to your customers uh, the point of it? as in rounding up and where it goes and I mean because you don't have a conversation people are just ordering online yeah. presumably so you can we, we've done it two ways so you can either do it when you do it at checkout where you can round up your order so that that would come through in that respect um, but also we do things such as we might do a charitable meal deal so you've probably all seen where you can get a pizza and sides etc for a set price and we would say that a pound or two pounds will go to the charity so we do it we do it a couple of ways do you believe people uh, come to you for pizzas partly for that reason oh, does definitely. it make that much of a difference yeah. I, I, I definitely think you know um, 
we, we, we just have to. I mean, it's something that our customers are asking us for. It's something our teams are asking us for. So we've, ju we've just got to make sure that we're doing it. So, um, you know, we do, we do try and talk it up as much as possible, yes. Gary, retail, toys. Will there be toys on the shelves for Christmas, Gary? <laughs> <laughs> That's what we want to know. Well, hopefully not, because I'm hoping we're going to buy them. <laughs> hopefully you're going to sell them. Um, it is true to say that there are one or two logistical problems, but um, we've filled our shops up to the brim. You can't get into the broom cupboard, they're full of toys at the moment. But 40% uh, of the UK's annual turnover in toys is from Monday last week, this week, to Christmas. It's just in eight weeks, it's a very big portion of our turnover. So keeping the lorries moving is critical, keeping people in the warehouses working is critical, keeping the warehouses safe, and you've mentioned this is absolutely critical. So we've started to reinforce some of our COVID policies because we can't afford now to, to trip up the last hurdle. And also as well, you can't afford to lose your staff at the moment in terms of being off because they're unwell or they're having to isolate or whatever. So talk us through how you've how you have, you know, gone over these last couple of years. I've gone over is probably not, not the right road to use. You know how you've got through yeah. twenty months, and have you stuck to your commitment of ten percent of net profits through that? And you know, as we heard from Sir Malcolm earlier, if you're not making money, you can't give money. Well, the last twenty months for a retailer that's been closed for seven has been really challenging. And uh, as a family business with no outside borrowings and no outside uh, partners, American corporations funding you to sit at home uh, at the beginning of April last year and work out how many weeks would it be before we physically run out of money. Um, there were some very long nights when I thought within, within eight weeks maybe we'd be bust. Um, as it happens, we were losing money <coughs> financing the staff because um, we paid them 100% um, because those guys were struggling too. In fact, it was, it was even more expensive than that because we had people working in our warehouses. I didn't feel it was fair that you could pay people not working 100% and people who did come to work 100% so we paid them 110%. Uh, so uh, we were losing money at the rate of about one and a half million pounds a month just keeping things ticking along and I have to say, I want to speak up for the government. Hindsight's great because a few people got a lot of it at the moment. But in those critical few months, um, the rates of support and the COVID support was, uh, the uh, fellow support was outstanding. They've saved our business and, and thousands of jobs. But um, I guess from a penny's perspective, I believe that, that business can be a force for good. So if you start from that premise, it's how do you, how can we as business leaders um, generate, um, we're wealth generators, but how can we promote generosity? Um, and uh, just three quick ways. One, I think you have to lead from the front. So we give 10% of our, of our charitable, of our profits to charity. Um, and I like um, Mr. Walker's, uh, Sir Walker's um, uh, definition, I decide who we give it to. It's fantastic because you're in complete control. But I love the charities that, that we give uh, our money to. But I want my staff to be generous as well. Um, and uh, for that reason, uh, we match um, on a payroll giving scheme when our staff give and 38% of our staff give every month to a charity of their choice. And then when Alison came to see us about pennies all those years ago and said, you know, you could get your staff, your customers involved. I said, how was that going to be? And in the first instance, I thought, yeah, that's in the too hard box. But actually, it was so easy. So anybody's concerned about queues at Teals or other complications of introducing pennies, I'll give you my personal invitation. I'll stand in the shop for half an hour with you when I've got a queue half an hour long at Christmas and you watch how amazing it is and how many, how many customers thank you for offering the facility to enable them to give to a charity. And then one last thing, Trestle Trust, <clears throat> because generosity is more than just cash. Generosity can be cash. It has to be cash in many ways. Generosity can be, for those of us in the room, we've got skills and talents. How do you pass the button up, baton on to the next uh, generation? And thirdly, we've got assets that we can make use. And I sat down with the CEO of Trestle Trust in February uh, 2020, and sort of, you know, before the pandemic really got going, I said, if I could ever help you, just give me a ring. So to my amazement, in uh, April of 2020, she rang me. She said, um, Tesco's have given us um, I don't know, it was 30, 240 articles of stock of uh, food over an eight week period. But how are we going to get them out to all the little Trestle Trust um, food banks? And our warehouse was closed because shops were closed. 
and we employed the staff, put the lorries on the road, received six Arctics of stock a day, reconfigured the stock and put them into hubs all around the country. Um, and uh, I, I went to um, a prize giving where the Trestle Trust turned up to, to thank our warehouse staff. Over eight weeks, we, did, we handled nine million meals. Um, so it's just a willing... <laughs> So I think, I think bring this back to pennies, for those of us that are in a, a position of, of making a decision, it's a willingness to make these things happen. Mm -hmm. Because you'll get told it's too hard, it's too hard, you can't. But actually as business leaders, our job in life is just to dismiss all those obstacles and find ways of making things happen. Mm. Yeah. Ted, Hello. Freddie's Flowers, ha, ha, just talk us through how that's been going, because I assume, have you had a bit of a nightmare with flowers stuck at borders and no we've been very lucky actually so we, we uh, problems. We've, uh, we've been around for six years and uh, we sort of battled hard scrapping around without <coughs> any external funding growing for five years and then covid came and uh, while half our new customers at that time were brought in by a team of charming face-to-face -face salespeople they may have <laughs> knocked on your door at some point in time we had to close it overnight but every, all our other channels took off so in a space of two months, the business, which had taken five years to grow, doubled in size. So our, our, our problem, much like business, was how do we accommodate that growth while keeping our staff safe? So you didn't have supply issues? We were, no, because, because the, uh, uh, the, the flower shops across Europe shut. And so there was a glass, the flowers are still in the ground. So there was plenty of availability. So we were very lucky. And no problem getting them back and forth? No, no. Oh. Oh, that's really positive. Yeah. That's very positive. I didn't expect you to say yeah. that at all, <laughs> yeah. which Good is great. Sorry. So talk us through your thoughts on what you've been hearing so far this evening and what does that mean within your space? I think, well, I mean, we don't yet have pennies, but we're in the process of uh, putting, in, putting in pennies and we hope to be live in the new year, early in the new year. Um, it's a fantastic facilitator for doing good. And our staff want to do good and our customers want to do good. I'll give, give you an illustration of that. We've not been flush with cash. So we've only, as I said, because we have, up until recently hadn't taken external funding, every spare penny we've ever made has gone back into the business. Um, but we have looked to give in other ways. So earlier last year, I was lucky enough to spend a couple of weeks in Zimbabwe and I came across a, a friend's charity called the Tag Rugby Trust. And without going into too much detail, the purpose of the charity is to it uses rugby to get young, poor people together and then once, it's almost like you know, bees around a honeypot, once it's, once it's got these people together, it uses that forum to train young people, teach, teach them leadership, get them involved in community projects, look out for women's health and various other projects. Um, and I watched them playing this tag rugby one day in 40 degree heat and the kids are wearing scraps, got no shoes. And I just thought that's crazy that we can do something about that. But we don't have a lot of money. We put, gave them a little bit of money, but what we did have and we do have is 170,000 customers who we deliver flowers to on a regular basis. So we just ask our customers, what, you know, can you help? And uh, much smaller numbers, we're only a little business, but in, you know, in a matter of three weeks, we collected three and a half thousand pairs of shoes and 8,000 strips. And it's a small thing, but that demonstrates a massive um, kind of a, a desire by our customers to do good and to be engaged with us. And pennies is just another, it facilitates us in doing that in another way. As Alison said, a penny is a small thing and yet collectively it makes a huge yeah. difference. Uh, Jerome, for Wilco, talk us through the challenges you face, but also, you know, what, what you've done to overcome that and, and, and what you've done at Wilco in terms of social purpose. So we were very similar to Liz um, and uh, Ted, allowed to be open, a privilege to do that. Uh, we were given four hours notice that we would stay open. <laughs> right. That's not bad when you've got 20,000 people and 400 shops. <laughs> and uh, my team members turned up the next day. Nobody decided not to turn up. And that was quite special because mm. the, the team members really care for the community they serve. We had to re-gear ourselves very, very quickly. Um, and we realized that actually the purpose that we serve was for people to be able to stay at home that they need jobs to do. So all of a sudden stuff that you wouldn't expect to find at Wilco, which we had, became really relevant, whether it's paint, whether it's little jobs and so on and so forth, because you couldn't get anybody to do the job for you. 
that allowed us to really maintain our relationship with our customers and we kept all our fundraising active during the time whilst keeping everybody safe and then we allowed our stores to support the, the community they were in so whilst we support three big charities we also opened our doors to everybody else who needed us whether it was particularly it was interesting there was three main demands that came through one way around the, supporting the food trusts the other one was pets okay. in terms of the pet charities because a lot of the sudden before everybody got a pet because they were at home a lot of pets and a lot of support disappeared immediately mm. so how do we support not only humans but also our, our pets and then the last one was really around the, the other project that you don't see in a community so all the youth clubs that were the people had no places to go so how do we create and provide means for kids to have some entertainment whilst being at home and whether it's through coloring books stationery and so on and so forth and the stores were fantastic they were fully empowered we allocated a certain amount of cash to say no questions asked do the best that you can do good that was the strap line just do good and that purpose agenda as it were i mean what difference does that make uh, so I think there's so many different facets to purpose. I mean, uh, could you, sorry, I mean, could you even say on a, on, a, on a monetary value what difference it makes? I don't want to put money on it. No. It's doing the right thing. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, it's interesting you should say that, and we, we all catch your heart on the, on the stage here, but f if you were to sort of sell it to investors or a fund manager or shareholders, they kind so, of, they want to see the return, So, so I, I gave away, I don't know, five, six million pounds worth of stock last year. Mm. two different charities that needed it and it was whether it's food non-food paint you name it um, we launched because we had planned to do so plastic free wipes so that's not something for charities but all our on brand wipes are plastic free so we launched them anyway because it was the right thing to do yeah um, we were the first one to put the face mask recycling in place that was a toughie for the team members. Yeah. So what do you mean? You're going to bring into our stores things that potentially is lethal to me. That was an interesting debate. Um, but when we explained what that was, they were like, no, actually, that makes sense because we don't want to see the streets littered with them. And if somebody, if somebody does it, then that's what's going to happen. So if you make it safe for us, then we'll do it. And it keeps on going. And it's being pragmatic on how you do things as opposed to I mean we don't like to shout about things at Wilco so <laughs> against Malcolm we really don't shout about say, we don't. I mean, <laughs> take his books home maybe there's some <laughs> advice in there <laughs> but Alison if we just bring out the point here that you know it's clear to me anyway just listening to the, these four but also Sir Malcolm that the CEO the leadership the culture put in place is critical Absolutely critical, it really is, because, and different organisations want to do it differently, and it's, it, we'll all have our views, some might like to do it quietly because it's the right thing, some might like to shout about it, but the point is you've got to do it, but you can't do it if you've got a leadership not giving you the time and space, yeah. and that's what I've been so bowled over with in the last 20 months, when leaders shouldn't have had time to have these conversations, conversations, but they've made time and pennies is a tiny part, but they've made time, they've made energy, they've allocated resource. And it's as if there's this groundswell of those that were doing it, but those that maybe have been either guilt tripped in or just realised that that's what colleagues are asking for. Because yeah. colleagues can choose where to work. And if you're not going to give them a, an ethical company that somewhere they're proud to work, you're not going to get them. So yeah. it starts at the basics, I think. And Liz, just interestingly, I mean, you're working in, you know, more than 20 countries. What's happening in other countries? Is this something wow. you're seeing elsewhere? Well, funnily enough, I mean, we did a lot of charitable work over, um, over the past year. In, we took a lot of the learnings from the UK and put it into other markets around the world. If I could get a pennies into the markets that I look after, they would snap it up. And, and we are looking at what, what's available. And there's not much available. But, um, but that's probably um, a long-term strategy. Challenge yes. <laughs> accepted. Um, pennies yeah, is so. going global, folks. <laughs> Breaking news. But anyway, go on, Liz. Um, so, uh, sorry. What, what? Well, no, I just wanted to know what, what the situation is in other countries in terms of the appetite 
forgiving. Yeah, I mean, I we're think, seeing it yeah. certainly in the UK. I mean, I think pizza, pizza was an easy thing that where we were trading, which was most of the countries around the world. Um, you know, the first thing that, you know, we said to do, and I think it's the point around it, we didn't go and get loads of publicity over it, but the amount of pizzas that we donated to hospitals and, and everyone that was work, I mean, it was incredible. And it was just, we would share them internally of various franchisees around the world or in the UK. And it just had this ripple effect that everyone wanted to, to go and do it. And we weren't seeking to try and get any kind of publicity from it. We weren't going out and shouting about it. And it was just being picked up, you know, mm. organically by local papers or, you know, local social media sites. And that's what was great about it. It was yeah. that we were just doing the right thing. Because I know, you know, with all of you, I would imagine a lot of what, what you invest in and what you're looking to in, in terms of giving is, is, is local. And that's very important. But what we're seeing is, you know, global COP26, you know, collaboration globally is so important, a global response to a global pandemic. I mean, Ted, you're, you're looking at expanding more overseas. You operate in Germany quite extensively already. I mean, are you thinking in terms of your social purpose in that frame as well? Absolutely. And I've certainly found in Germany, it's, it's um, if anything, it's more in demand in Germany than the UK. Um, and not just the kind of giving, but also the environmental uh, uh, issues. And, you know, last year we became carbon neutral, but there's, a, there's an awful lot further to go. And we, we're learning that from our German customers, actually. They're demanding it. Um, absolutely. But interesting what Liz said as well. <coughs> our, our, you know, during that, I've, you reminded me, I'd forgotten during that, the peak of the lockdown, just giving flowers that we were, you know, for us it was flowers. So, you know, to various hospitals, we'd just deliver a hundred boxes of flowers to this hospital and that, and not talk about it to our customers, but our staff, absolutely. And of course, you know, yeah, the yeah. students loved it. Great. Gary, from your perspective, what have the challenges been? And obviously you're a big giver. You've, you partnered with Pennies quite some time ago, but, but what sort of hasn't worked and you've had to iron out? Hmm. Oh. Um, I don't know really. I, I think I think we try and find <coughs> good in everything that we do, um, even when we're under the pressure that we were under. <clears throat> there were still positive things that we can do. And I remember something that a, a Woolworths manager said to me 35 years ago. Um, I spoke out in Amersham about the fact we had no Christmas lights, so I got given the Chamber of Commerce chairman's job. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I remember walking around the high street saying to all the shops, um, can we chip in 20 pounds for the Christmas lights? We're gonna put the lights up. And I walked into Woolworths and I said, can you give me 20 pounds for the Christmas lights for Amersham? He said to me, do you know how many shops we've got? I said, I don't know, actually. He said, well, if every shop gave 20 pounds, that would be an awful lot of money. Uh, so 35 years later, I still remember that conversation thinking, yeah, but you've got an awful lot of shops and you're taking an awful lot of money out of an awful lot of local communities. Surely your local communities, every one of them, should get something back. So as we've opened more shops over the last um, 30 years, I've given, as you said, empowered the managers to play their part in the local community. So regardless of the group that you're representing, the Cubs, the Scouts, the church group, whatever it might happen to be, there's vouchers for every raffle going. Yeah. Uh, because otherwise, if you don't give anything back to the community and you can keep buying all your toys and other gifts on Amazon, but you just write to them and ask for a donation and see how quickly you get a response. Mm. You know, <laughs> if you lose your high street, you will lose the heart of your community because your local high street in many of the local towns, they're the, they're the heartbeat with many of the things that other charities are doing. And that wasn't the answer to your question, but... <laughs> Don't worry. Don't worry. I'm used to that. I'm used to that. Go on, Liz. Um, just what Gary was talking about. The, the great thing about pennies is the ability. I mean, we're obviously a nationwide na national chain, but you do have the ability, and we don't have it currently at Papa John's, but it's something I would look at for the future of having different charities in different sectors, uh, different regions of the country. And I think, you know, we're a franchise business, and, you know, if we could say to that franchisee, actually, you just tell us which charity you want us to uh, to support. And I assume, you know, your franchises are going to be that much more engaged and yeah. supportive. Yeah. Because after we were hearing from Sir Malcolm, you know, everybody has their favourite charity <coughs> or, yeah. or something going on in their world that wants them to, to yeah. give to a cause. Or you can take it a step further. I mean, the one thing that, that we also looked at is getting, you know, 
I, I, I was interviewing last week, and it was the first time in an interview someone actually asked me about our social purpose. Mm. Um, and I thought, what a great question, and it's great that they're asking. And I think, you know, we're in a talent war at the moment. So people are choosing where they want to work, and they want us to have a social purpose. So I think if you can say what you do do, that is fantastic. But you could also use it to the benefit of, like, what we, we did at Papa John's, and this is nothing I, I put in. It will not take the credit for it. But we have team members of the month, which I'm sure a lot of, a lot of businesses do. One of the things that we let them do as team member of the month was choose the charity that we would support for that month, yeah. which, again, is a fabulous thing. Can you imagine going home and saying, you know, um, I'm supporting Alzheimer's Society or whatever um, to, you know, to your grandparents or whatever? That would be fantastic for, for a team member to do. And um, we haven't got much time left, but Jerome, a, another word from you. If you were to just share with our audience, both at home and in the room, what tips, I suppose, you would give for those who are leaders within business who haven't yet embarked on this journey? Wow, OK. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I really put people on the spot. You, you have there, yeah. You've got about a minute. I've got about <laughs> a minute. OK, so I'll, I'll keep it short. So I think, so we'll be live on Pennies very soon. So I think um, Pennies has a very call to not only maintain what you're already doing, but enhance it is absolutely critical. I think consumers are now used to doing things themselves. We've educated the last 20 months have been predicated upon that. So this is just us making sure that we give them access to feeling, I'm going to say guilt-free giving, because <laughs> it's little and often. Um, there's no real tips. It's just if you believe you're doing the right thing and if it's pragmatic that your customers and team members see it, then it's good enough. It doesn't have to be big, mm. but it's got to be repeatable. Yeah. Oh, and that's the little and often mindset. That, Gary, you're that itching to say something, I can tell. Well, <clears throat> I want to be an ambassador Keep for pennies. Keep it brief, please, Gary. I will, and, brief. and Alison will expect me to say this, but if you went to try and raise three quarters of a million pounds, as I've tried to do for another project in the last yes. 12 months, you'll be sending thousands of letters out and you'll get a lot of non-responses. That's how much money the entertainer raises every year, 42 pence at a time, three quarters of a million pounds. As business leaders, particularly with large chains of retailers, you can create a, math, a massive amount of benefit to local charities, a very small amount at a time, and it adds up to a huge, huge sum. Every penny counts. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I th I'm sure you will agree. Incredibly inspiring. And thank you so much for sharing your experiences, your wisdom, your stories. We really appreciate it. Thank you all. Um, <laughs> well, so now we're going to do a bit of a bit of musical chairs and remove some of these chairs because we will continue with our evening. And next we turn to the awards where we are going to celebrate the businesses and individuals who are going over and above in terms of expanding the opportunities for us to give a little back. Now, earlier this year, Penny's gathered together a panel of cross-industry leaders. We shall see them. Here they are now. We're very grateful to all of these uh, industry leaders from retail, from hospitality, from fintech, uh, from paytech, to review and recognize outstanding partner brands and individuals. So they had a real job on their hands, but they delivered. And I'm going to hand you back now to Alison, who will reveal all. Thank you, Sally. And this is definitely one of the most exciting bits for me of the evening because we have so many amazing partners. I didn't need to make any decisions. It's fantastic because these amazing people did all the hard work. Um, this is our second awards and it's absolutely delightful for me to be able to, first of all, before we get into them, of which there are five. So this isn't an award ceremony that goes on for hours. There's five awards just so that everyone can manage. But before we go into that, I just wanted to recognise that last year we put some recognition out for people that had been with Pennies through the journey. And there is a whole range of brands that have joined the Pennies journey. And I'm delighted to see that there's nobody that's joined Pennies that's ever left Pennies, which after 11 years, I think, speaks for itself. And so we celebrated so many brands that have been with us. But tonight, I just wanted to celebrate, there's eight new brands that have now been with us for two years. Let's see who those are. 
These are the eight new brands that have now not been with us one, but two years. And there's six brands that have now joined us and been with us for three years. You can all have your favourite football club. There's more we need to go to, so come and help us. Uh, Newcastle United, I'm on the way. Um, five years. Then it'll be seven new brands that have joined us. For five years they've been with us, which has just been absolutely fantastic. And in fact, I think Fuller's has just passed over a million consumer donations. So congratulations to the team over there. So, uh, and then there's one other that's joined us for over 10 years have been with us, a small team in Barracudas, but a very critical team that really works with kids and provides such amazing support. And what Barracudas has joined is our pioneers, where we have a number of pioneers that have been with us now for over 10 years. And it's great that Barracudas can join that group. So thank you to everybody that started the journey, that remains with the journey, and that will do. So I'm aiming for 20 years shortly. So if you think that's it, we've got a long, long way to go. But thank you so much to each and every brand. Thank you. Now, the first award tonight is the Breakthrough Award. Now, the Breakthrough Award is there to recognise a partner that's helped move us into a new channel or into a new segment. Now, that was quite a challenge because despite all this lockdown, we had all these things going on. But we had our first fashion retailer that's made a major player in the high street and therefore we had an honourable mention to a pretty little thing who have been absolutely fantastic. And what's really impressed us with Pretty Little Thing is the level of detail, not surprising for online retailers, but the level of detail they've gone to get the customer journey just right. And when we evolved a little bit, the response from consumers was overwhelming. And so it's great that we're live and there's a number of other channels we're moving on to next. So that's fantastic. But the actual winner of our Breakthrough Award is something a little bit different. And I'm delighted to announce it's Till by Nat West. Now what Till are, are something very different from Penny's. And they approached us to see if we could do something different that actually could unlock giving back from the minute they opened up in the marketplace. And so what they were committing to do was to, with Penny's, create a give back foundation. But through their merchants, every time there was a transaction, Till wanted to give what I call a mini micro donation back into society. And that's just phase one. And in phase one, just this year, there's been over 30 million micro donations. So it's really been quite phenomenal. And we can't wait to see how we can involve that partnership. So I'd love you to hear from Andy. And if I can invite Andy and Mike and Charlotte in a second, I'd love to give you the trophy. But let's hear from Andy first. Thank you so much for this breakthrough award for our Give Back program. The team at Till and NatWest are delighted uh, as we are so proud that every single transaction that we process generates a micro donation for charity. Thank you also to the Penny's team for helping us to set up and manage this program. It's been absolutely fantastic so far. Congratulations. I can't come to you, so you need to come to me. Yes. I'm sorry, I can't come to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Andy. Thanks very much. We're going to get a picture just afterwards. Okay. We'll get one. Are we getting it now or after? Oh, no, we aren't. No. Right. Okay. Well, do this one, Andy. <laughs> Super. Well done. Thank you very much indeed. Now, the next award is a Step Change Award, and that is where we've had partners that have accelerated us into new channels. And the honourable mention for this award is to actually a friend of ours that was with us way in the beginning, Chandra Patney, where they helped us get into one of the first payment engines. But they have a company called HCE Services, and just a few weeks ago, they launched a company called iPause Up. 
and they are the people that have got this amazing honourable mention. And again, where Chandra was fantastic is he approached us saying, we love pennies, but we'd like to add to it. So it was another innovation for pennies, where not only when he's looking at those lovely, amazing micro merchants, not only can consumers give, the merchants can give back too, and he makes it very easy for them to do so. So we're very excited, having just launched a few weeks ago, to see what the potential is there as we accelerate into micro merchants. And the winner of this award is actually the Curries Group. It's been, it's been great to work with Curries. We started with Dixon's Carphone and we were with Dixon's Carphone for quite some time. And then actually a number of the team got together and said, we need to take this out across the group. And literally less than a year ago, it blew out. Literally within days, we were live and the opportunity and the response from customers has been phenomenal because not only are they really, really focused on how they manage digital inclusion given their digital focus, they've also been very committed to the elderly and age UK and technology and how it can help the elderly. So it's been a phenomenal response and I know there's even more that we've got underway. But let's hear from some of the colleagues at Curry's that wanted to say thank you. And then I'd love to invite Moira Thomas to take the award on behalf of Curry's. Thank you. Let's hear from the colleagues. We are honoured to be partnered with Penny's and we thank you. Thank you, Penny's. Thank you, Penny's. Thank you, Penny's. Thank you, Penny's. Thank you, Penny's, for our partnership. Thank you, Penny's. Thank you for the step two award. Congratulations, Moira. Thank you. Congratulations. Well done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, the third award is an Outstanding Achievement Award. And this is the organisations that have grown fastest in the last 12 months. And the panels have given actually a combined award for the honourable mention. It's to what I call our friends in roadside retailing. So there's HTech, who are the payments and technology company behind a lot of roadside retailer. There's Rontech and there's MFG. And between Rontech and MFG, we have pennies in over 750 petrol forecourts and roadside retailers. And what they did was took the leadership in implementing contactless and doing that ahead of the increase that you'll have seen just last month to increase up to £100. And the difference that has made to the consumer giving in that sector has been quite phenomenal. So huge thank you and congratulations to all these three partners. But the winner of this award actually goes to, again, two organisations, and Digital and the Azuri Group, which is easy and Ask. Now, we all know we've had a real surge in mobile order and pay. And what Zizi were finding was because they weren't quite yet open, able to open their restaurants to let people come in, they were doing a lot of takeaway. And they approached and, and Digital to say, how can we marry what we do in store in our app? And literally within weeks, which is where there can be perception of technology difficulties and there can be reality. But within weeks, and Digital had enabled the donations. It went live, immediately there was a massive response. Yes, now restaurants have opened up. They're also getting donations through traditional methods. But overall, we've more than doubled the donations as a result of this technology. And they're around 30% higher post-pandemic than they were pre-pandemic. So a huge congratulations. I'm not sure they're able to be with us tonight, but we're going to hear from Philippa, who is going to say a thank you from AND Group on behalf of them all. Hi everyone, we are delighted to be named the winner of the Penny's Outstanding Achievement Award. This award recognizes Azuri and N Digital huge and meaningful contribution to the micro donation movement. Thank you to everyone who has been visiting the restaurants and donating to Penny's when they pay. You are already making a huge difference. And now it came, comes to my personal favourite award and one that we all fight over at Penny's when we put forward the nominations. And it's called the Unsung Hero Award. And what you'll hear is that the, the actual judges have awarded three Unsung Hero Awards. But what you'll hear from every one of them is that it's not about them, but they're taking the award on behalf of the company. I can tell you these companies are brilliant, 
but this is about an individual award. The reason we say unsung is this isn't about the leaders. These are people that take it upon themselves to go above and beyond to help deliver for pennies, which is why for me, it's those little acts of brilliance that make up the spirit of Penny. So the first award winner is Andy Colkett from Ingenico. Now Andy has worked and supported Penny's for years. He's got us into all the technology, he got us into contactless. He's so full of calmness. And so whenever you've got a new customer coming on board, there's not a frenetic issue, it's just solved. So I know Andy, you can't be with us tonight. I know you've got a bottle or a, is it a glass? I was told it was a bottle of something that you're celebrating with. So a huge congratulations and let's hear a few words from you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Andy Corkett, unsung hero. I can't sing, so I'm both surprised and honoured to receive this award. Penny's does great work improving lives by facilitating donations to charity. And the team at Ingenico are thrilled to have helped and be recognised in this way. Thanks again. I think I need to hear him sing after that, don't you? <laughs> There. The second winner of this award is a lovely lady called Helen Tosney Collins from Domino's. Now, as you know, actually at 10.17, you might not know this, at 10.17 yesterday, we were 11 years old because that's when Penny's received our first ever micro donation. And we were set up ready to go and we still only were third or fourth to be able to give our donation, which is why we knew 11 years ago that maybe, maybe this idea was something that might turn into something. And so Helen is probably the most bubbliest person you can ever meet. She's absolutely committed to making things happen at Domino's. She's picked up the lead from where Domino's have started. She, she used to look after charities alongside communications, and now her job is dedicated to looking after the new foundation that we've helped them set up, as well as some amazing things that we're looking to develop at Penny's. Now, Helen, you called me today as well to say you're really not feeling well and your kids aren't well, but you've definitely got a glass of bubbly in your hand. So congratulations, and let's hear what you had to say. Thank you and well done, Helen. We're so proud to have partnered with Pennies for over a decade. Giving back to our communities through our charity partners is so important to us all at Domino's, from our colleagues, our franchisees and our customers. Pennies makes giving back so easy. We've already done so much, but we know there's so much more we could do to raise awareness with our customers of the great work Pennies does for our partners. That's one of my priorities here at Domino's. And that's why this award means so much. Thank you, it's such an honor. Get well soon, Helen. I really hope you get well very, very soon. Uh, our third Unsung Hero Award goes to a lady called Elle Hewitson from MBS. Now we, you might have heard me saying earlier, we are privileged to have some amazing advisory board members that guide pennies across retail, hospitality and the payments industry. And one of our members of that retail advisory board, Elliot Goldstein, who's a partner at MBS, we decided it might be really brilliant to add a few new brands onto our advisory board as we start to really go through the next level of growth. Elf kindly said that would be a great thing for her to offer to do on a pro bono basis. Little did she know those two or three people came into 21 new chief executives and senior leaders across both industries that have now joined us. And Elf would say I was just doing my job. It was far more. Let's hear from Elf and then I'm looking forward to thanking you personally, Elf. I'm absolutely thrilled to have won the Penny's Unsung Hero Award and to have helped further the micro donation movement by appointing 21 senior executives to the Penny's advisory groups. The MBS group is a leading executive search firm specialising in the retail, leisure and consumer sectors and I'm proud to have leveraged our network on a pro bono basis to help Penny's achieve its goals. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Yes, okay. Thank you. 
Thank you. Now, our last and final fifth award is a special recognition award. And it's an award that a panel looks at some of our partners have been with us for the journey and to recognise the great work they've done. And this is an organisation you have heard from earlier from Gabriel. They were first to put us in their terminals, first to put us in their payment system, first to go contactless, first to reach over six million. And we are genuinely on a springboard to be doubling that very soon. World Pay from FIS, I'm absolutely delighted to, to recommend and to be able to celebrate this amazing award. I know, Pete, you're here to take the award on behalf, but let's listen to Vicky and Ron, who I know are at the front line every day championing Penny's and my lovely Penny's team. Hi, everyone. It's a great honour to receive this special recognition award. World Pay have been a supporter of Penny's from the beginning and have helped to raise over £6 million to date. At a time when we're moving closer to a cashless society, helping to support charitable giving through payments is becoming more important. And I encourage everyone who isn't already engaged in conversations with Pennies to put it at the top of their agenda. Have a great evening. Thank you, Pennies. This is a great recognition of the work that we've been doing here at WorldPay. There's a real focus on helping our customers to engage with Pennies, to be able to support them with their own charitable aims. And it's fantastic to know that this is helping so many great causes. Thanks again. Sorry, I can't walk. So that brings me to close, really. Uh, where have the 90 minutes gone? They've just blown away. And I hope tonight you've picked up some ideas, some thoughts, some inspiration, and maybe, maybe, maybe just a few things that you can go away and put into practice in part of your everyday lives. You know, people have said, we're next for pennies. Well, we've thought long and hard, and the challenge we've agreed with our trustee board and our advisory board is that we'd like to try and aim to achieve in the next three years what we've done in the last 10. And that means we'd love to raise another £25 million from 100 million consumer donations. And with the springboard and the acceleration you've heard today, we really want to try and get off to a fast start in 2022. You know, even in the last few weeks, we've welcomed a whole new range of brands to the Penny's family. In hospitality, we've welcomed people like Carluccio's, Frankie and Benny's, Chiquito's, Compass, in the retailing world, we've had Snow and Rock, we've got Cotswolds Outdoor, and Stop Press, as of today, I think it's in one site, but it's soon to be rolled out, Tool Station have joined the wonderful Penny's family. So we are super excited with, with those brands and the many others we have underway about the potential. But we are a small team at Penny's, and we cannot do it ourselves. We absolutely need your help. But our ask of you is please talk to me, talk to the team, talk to other people, all these brands. They'll tell you about their experiences. They'll tell you about what's worked, what's not, what they want to do better, because we've got some really clear ideas on what more we can do to make colleagues and customers feel even better about these micro donations. But I'm thoughtful about time, and I therefore want to close. I don't know how many of you know a gentleman called James Lovell. He was actually an astronaut and probably best known for Apollo 13, where that was about to be a massive disaster. And he's been heralded as the individual that helped the crew together and landed them safely. And here's a quote which says, there are people who make things happen. There are people who watch things happen. There are people who actually just wondered what happened. But to be successful, you need to be the person that makes things happen. And my invitation to you is please be that person. Join us in this Penny's journey, because actually if everybody just spread the word, donated when you see it, spoke to a friend, give us your challenges, then together we will create a legacy that makes us all feel great and helps millions and millions of communities in the UK and hopefully at some point further a sea. Thank you so much for your time. Sani, please take us away. Thank you.
you, Alison. As I said at the very beginning, you get the passion, right? You get it, absolutely. Um, what an immense achievement so far. So well and clearly illustrated uh, this evening. Lots of work to do, but the vision is there to do it. They've got that small dynamic team uh, working with them, an incredible leader, but also all those fantastic partners and supporters. So especially those in hospitality and retail. The past 20 months, I'm sure you will all agree, has been probably one of the most challenging times in recent history, experienced by businesses, by charities, fintech, by consumers, by all of us. We've all been there. And as we very clearly heard today, collectively, we can and we are still making a difference, a penny at a time. So thank you from me too, to all uh, the speakers tonight. Once again, thanks for all your contributions. Thank you to our fabulous panellists who were absolutely uh, great uh, in sharing their expertise. And also thank you to Rothschild for allowing us to use this superb space this evening. And a big thank you to Avio uh, replay, who've been the production support uh, tonight. I'm sure you will agree, a fantastic job. You don't know they're there. You know they've done a good job when you don't know they're there. So uh, it just leaves us to say uh, thank you as well to all of you who've been watching online. You stayed with us to the end. So thank you so much. Have a great evening and good night. <laughs>